Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, I'm honored to be included here at the Kenton Computer Festival. And I'm going to be talking about my new book. And uh, it's called Constructing Music. Um, and it's sort of a music theory manual for the digital age. I'll be talking about why I wrote it, what it's about, and a little bit of how it connects to AI, which is the theme of the session today. So thanks for being here. And please feel free if you have questions or would like to, you know, discuss any aspect of it, um, you know, just raise your hand. Let's, you know, let's start the Q&A as part of the talk, as has worked so well in the sessions before mine. Um, so why why uh, write a, a book about music theory in the digital age? Um, and welcome back, Rebecca. I, Here I am. We I, started with I, that. I started. We started. No, no, bad, bad. <laughs> <laughs> I just oh, wanted to introduce you, Teresa. And I'm so grateful for your invitation. Oh, yeah, I really totally appreciate you being here. So, Teresa, I guess, I don't know if you mentioned that you're a professor here at TCN the Music Department and have many leadership roles here. Uh, but we go pretty far back yeah. to, I'm not even exactly sure when, but... <laughs> But we both had an affinity for Marvin Minsky and, you know, uh, uh, John Nash and, you know, a lot of real famous gurus. And, and she's helped arrange some of these talks here on campus and stuff like that, which has just been fantastic. And we get together and talk about things we're going to do and then we never do them. But it's OK. Actually, we will. So, but, she, what she did do was write this book. And when you go on sabbatical, you always say you're going to do something, yeah. but then you don't necessarily do it. But she did do it. <laughs> so she did do it. So, And it's been tremendously successful. She'll tell you where the copies are when you leave here. You should go yeah. pick up one. And it's going to be great. So the other thing um, was that I was looking back to the Music, Mind, and Invention mm -hmm. paper of Marvin Minsky, because I always reread it every now and again, but I was looking at it last night specifically to introduce you, and I didn't realize that he actually used the phrase AI, artificial intelligence, don't we call it AI? Then. He used it in that in that paper. He was yeah. talking about artificial intelligence, and what was it, 82, I think the yeah. paper was. 81, it was 81. 81, yeah, yeah, right, and then it was in the Computer Music Journal. So, but anyway, so, you know, some of these great thinkers have been doing this for a very long time, including you. So, yeah. so you. but thank you very much for being here. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca mentioned it here. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Uh, so I'll tell the story. I think I have it on the next slide. Perhaps I'll just jump right in. Yeah. So Rebecca mentioned Marvin Minsky and his paper, Music, Mind, and, and Meaning. Meaning, meaning, mind, and meaning, right. And so why am I here talking about this in an AI conference? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Well, and so I'll just say that um, that I was a music major in college, um, you know, was deeply invested in classical music. I started my own orchestras and uh, conducted operas and, um, and knew that there was this interesting stuff that was happening with computing but didn't really know how to bridge those worlds. And I was just very fortunate that at the very moment when I wanted to go to grad school, that the MIT Media Lab had a position for someone with my training. So I landed in the Media Lab uh, at the time when the Brain Opera was being um, put together and ended up performing with that production that was Todd Macover's composition uh, he took it to four continents. We performed it over 150 times. Wow. On four continents. And what the, the sort of accident in my life uh, that enabled me to combine my love of classical music with new technology and computing and coding and AI was um, also the opportunity to be in the same research area with one of the um, inventors of the field, one of the you know original folks at the Dartmouth conference, uh, <laughs> right, right. founder of the MIT AI lab, uh, but his name is Martin Minsky, and his office was a few doors down from mine because he was a mentor to my, my doctoral supervisor. So um, whenever I was working in my office late at night on my thesis or whatever, and I heard the piano in the common area, so I was going to say that Martin was in the common area. <laughs> 
And so I would go out and sit and chat with Marvin. And he was always up. He was not only an AI expert, but he also loved music. And Marvin felt that music was one of the most salient characteristics of what makes us human. And so in over many years of conversation with Marvin, we talked a lot about music and how it works, how it works on us, how it affects both our uh, you know, imagination, our, our ability to think, and also our, um, our emotional capacities. So music, he felt, kind of touches on all these very uniquely human experiences. And so uh, this is a, a you know an image from some conversations about music that we um, taped later in around 2010. And then as Rebecca mentioned, we, we brought him <laughs> to CNJ and got John Nash to come also. So it's the whole family there. <laughs> so this is 2012, that bottom right hand of the corner, uh, Marvin gave a talk in the um, in the Mayo Concert Hall, sort of linking two parts of my life together, the TCNJ Music Department, and his impact on my thinking about music. And yes, John Nash, who had been his grad school friend back when they were both in when they sort of a highlight. He came in a few minutes after the talk, talk started, and everybody's going, oh, John Nash, oh, John Nash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was a great wonderful. moment. Yeah, there was a great moment for us personally. Yes, yeah. personally, it was so great to yeah. be there for them. So, so I have to give credit to Rebecca for, for remembering that. <laughs> So special it was, to it was so great and little echoes of it have ended up in this book because um you know i had the opportunity to uh through talking with an ai pioneer about music start to think about music theory in a different way and so where you know whereas i had been tra tra trained in a very kind of traditional approach to uh thinking about music the fundamentals you know chords scales keys etc you know, how they're constructed and to learn the, the kind of vocabulary of music. You know, Marvin got me thinking about all the different other ways that you could think about music's impact on us and how it's put together. Uh, he used to say things like, um, you know, the way we learn music theory is very prescriptive. It's very much like a grammar, he said, but that doesn't get at the procedural experience of music. And he used to, you know, we used to talk about things like process and how music evolves over time and how it teaches you its logic as it as it evolves. Um, and so, you know, what I what I came to in terms of um, writing my book was to think about, okay, well, how would we take some of these sort of more unusual procedural thoughts about music and also look at this whole generation of young people who experienced the pandemic and even before that, they've basically spent their lives on laptops and devices. And so they're not learning music in the traditional manner through instrumental lessons and singing in a choir and kind of progressing through the notation system. They're learning music entirely through software. And so for them, they don't necessarily want to or, or feel the need to learn the music notation system. They'd rather you know, apply a visual metaphor of kind of colored blocks on a 2D grid and create music kind of structurally, um, you know, a, a totally different way. And so the the question that came out of, you know, those, those conversations with Marvin, one of them was, well, how might we teach music theory differently if we didn't have to use notation at all, that five line staff that everyone learns. And so I've been, I kind of pulled ideas from AI and from constructionism and you know, thinking about how simulation and visualization and experimentation could be applied in the study of music theory. Um, and the idea was also, well, how what you know, if we didn't have the five line staff, what would be another way to do it? Would we use, for example, uh, what we would call a DAW, like a digital audio workstation like Logic or Pro Tools? And I had a lot of conversation with people about that. And we felt actually. It would be helpful, though those systems are closed systems in the sense you can't edit that. I mean, you can put your notes down and you can add your effects and your automation and reverb and all that, but <laughs> in a way it doesn't get at the procedural quality of, of what we're thinking about in terms of how do you put music together. And so coding became the paradigm that I thought we could experiment with in terms of what, you know, what could a student do to kind of 
click blocks of musical structure together, sort of like Lego um, or, or Tinker Toy, right? So think about music as a set of Lego bricks. Um, so as part of my book, there are dozens of software examples that readers get to interact with, yeah. and they get to unlock those connections and manipulate them and change them. And so part of what I do when I distribute the code is I say, this is at the end product. What I'd like you to do is take this little block of code and make it your own. You know, apply this, build out this idea or that idea. So some of these code blocks in a way are not complete or they're they're uh, snippets, right? They're, and, and so the idea is, well, what would you do creatively with this little bit of functionality that I'm providing to you, the reader? Um, and I should also add that in addition to kind of the, the whole impact of AI and coding on this project, um, an experience I had um, with a project called Trenton Makes Music, which we ran here at TCNJ for a long time, especially my interactions with the wonderful Sarah Dash, who I don't, I don't know if you can see her in the upper right and upper left there. Uh, she was a pop singer, a member of LaBelle's, uh, oh. the trio, Patti LaBelle's trio. She grew up in Trenton. Um, she was a backup singer for the Rolling Stones and Keith Richards. She had an extraordinary career. She was, um, um, she's in the New Jersey Hall of Fame for her work with the Grammy Board of Governors. And she lived a mile from this campus. So uh, Sarah would come over and as part of our project, we would interview musicians from Trenton. So I, I started to realize through Sarah that, um, there are whole swaths of the public, not just you know in America, like in you know certain swaths of the of the of the public that we're supposed to be serving as a public institution, who are not being served by our approach to teaching music theory. And Sarah, in particular, taught me that uh, one day she just composed a song right on the fly. She said, "Give me your phone." I said, "Okay, fine." I gave her my phone, <laughs> and on my voice memo, she just sang something into my phone. I still have it actually today. Oh, wow, that's so cool. Um, and you know, she sang this like little lick and a couple of couple of um, melodic lines, and she said, "There you go. There's your theme song for our project." And I said, "Well, that's just like a voice memo." <laughs> I did that. Um, and she said, "Don't worry. I'll bring the band in next week, and we'll just record it." Mm -hmm. And so, without any sheet music whatsoever, <laughs> she brought in her band. You know, we, we into our recording studio here. She taught them all the two two three minute song. Verb, she sang it to them and they just recorded it without hardly a rehearsal at all. Like the whole thing was done in 20 minutes. Wow. And so I, I, I think realizing that one can be incredibly musical without any notation at all. <laughs> I, I thought we're missing the boat here because we're all using the same language of tonal um, music. Many of us are, are building up structures as was Sarah's piece used conventional tonality that we teach in music theory classes, but simply completely through the oral tradition. And there are many other traditions around the world that use oral tradition to, um, to teach music. So anyway, so it's kind of a confluence of coding and oral tradition and thinking about how can we reach a wider population. Um, and also what, co ta what COVID taught me during, during those years of being stuck at home was <laughs> that millions of kids were stuck at home during those years. And many of them, you know, obviously spent hours and hours every day on their laptops or devices. And of course, there were lots of really terrible things they could be doing on, on those devices. But one of the really beneficial things that helped a lot of kids was to be creative, whether it was in editing video or audio, you know, basically making new stuff. It's that constructionist idea of, you know, using the process of making something new to teach you something new about yourself. It's sort of engaging in a um, conversation of learning with, with the project that you're making. Um, and so, you know, I think the kids who really uh, benefited were the ones who found a creative outlet. And certainly music became an effective form of emotional therapy for in, in my household, <laughs> I'm sure in plenty of others. Um, and you know, this is also an ancient use for music that goes back millennia in human culture. So uh, all of these ideas kind of impacted me along the way as I was trying to think about what my music theory book would be. And finally, a lot of people say, well, okay, you did away with the five line notation process. 
but they said, but you replaced it with something harder, which is coding. <laughs> so that's not fair, right? You know, it's kind of, that's, you know, you kicked out one thing that was hard and replaced it with another thing that was harder. But I think um, the reason why I think this could work is because today's students are already on their laptops a lot and devices. And the particular type of software environment that I picked is very easy to pick up. It was designed for musicians. It allows you to simulate an experiment with and modify simple blocks of code. And it's not text-based, it's object-based. So you kind of can visually see this function block connects to this function block, connects to this one, literally with these kind of patch cords, they call them. So you're not like dealing with very abstract text-based coding. Um, yeah, and what I've seen in my classes when I've taught this material at TCNJ, what I really love about this work is that um, uh, usually these classes bring in a classroom um, that's quite diverse across many different, you know, um, you know, intersectional divides, but also um, I, it combines people who are proficient in coding with people who are coding phobic. <laughs> and what I've loved about um, when I when I use this content in the classroom is that I find that musicians teach music theory to the coders and the coders teach the musicians of the program. <laughs> and so there's this kind of mutual benefit that happens that I think can be very helpful. So um, so anyway, so that's a little bit about the background. Um, and so now let me give you a few demos. You're probably wondering what, what is this thing? Let's get to it. Um, so the uh, I'm just going to show you three demos of the kinds of ways of thinking about music theory that are in the book. Here is, I, I, made, I took a video of a playthrough. This is a, a what's called a max patch. This is a piece of code. And basically this is the very first tutorial that anyone gets in the book. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm teaching the analogy of the loop. So the loop is one of the very simplest, most simple uh, coding constructs. And it's also one of the basic constructs in music. And the idea here is that you have a, a, a loop where you trigger these, these little squares or they call buttons and they send trigger messages and the pipes are delays. So you send a trigger to a delay, which holds it for a certain number of milliseconds, it goes to the next trigger, the next trigger, et cetera. So because all of the delays are exactly identical, you get this little sort of, you think like holiday light display where the light just kind of bounces around from node to node. Um, and so that that notion of the loop construct is is important for lots of different reasons, and it's also important for tempo and meter. So when all the pipes have the same delay, you have a fixed tempo, meaning music plays with an equal spaced beats each pattern. In this case, it's uh, it's an irregular. It's a six. There are six beats here which is a little unusual for music. Typically they would be more, in Western music, you might have four or eight, you know, powers of two. But in any case, um, uh, anyway, this is, so here's, that's basically, you, you learn how to construct a loop. And then um, I'll just show you, because I don't have the program on running on this computer, I made a little video of it running on mine. So let me show you what this is like, and I'll add that the, the reader is instructed to play this alongside a song running at a particular number of beats per minute. So the piece that I had picked was Aretha Franklin's Respect. <laughs> and so the 550, 522 millisecond delay is intended to keep uh, the song exactly in time with the original. Here we go. I didn't think of For a very long period of time. <laughs> <laughs> the Muscle Shoals rhythm section is famous for their timing precision. And this was in the era, this song was recorded in the era prior to the click track. So that was completely human generated timing. 
And what the, the reader is then in, invited to do is unlock this patch and change it. So now you can import your own song, whichever song you like. Wow. You have to figure out what is the exact spacing between the beats. I provide an algorithm for determining that. Um, and you you can figure out, okay, so now I can get my, my loop to uh, correspond to any particular rhythm. Yeah, and the notion of meter in music ties into basically the loop point. So for example, this would, you know, if you were to follow every beat in this loop here, you'd have a six beat meter. So I said, well, if you want to have instead a meter that aligns with a you know, more standard uh, grouping of four, you could remove two of these nodes and then just have a four beat loop, or you could add two more and have an eight beat loop. And you start to get into the notion of what does meter mean, right? What is, what is that idea of a cycling, uh, you know, a cycle of a certain number of beats that maintains a rhythmic structure on which the the uh, the piece holds together. Oops. Okay, here's another example. This one is called Melody Machine. This is one of the more advanced uh, patches in the book, and this is a little bit AI like in the sense that um, you click a button and it automatically generates a melody in C major with a certain number of parameters. It takes those parameters from the standard music theory rule set of what makes a good sounding melody, uh, such as not too much noodling and repetition, uh, use of the full scale. Um, there is one rule that this, this one could use that it doesn't have, <laughs> uh, and it, it allows you to um, determine the, essentially the weighting of um, what interval size. So the music theory textbooks say you should emphasize small steps most of the time and every once in a while take a leap if you're writing a pleasant sounding melody. So that this distribution here says most of the time take a, a, a second, a, a neighboring note, and some of the time very rarely <laughs> take a large leap. Wow. Yeah. And here it says, you know, um, the, the the balance, I don't know if it's readable back there, the balance between quarter notes and eighth notes should be sort of, you know, pretty close to half-half. Here it's about six to four. So so this generates, on every click of, the, of the, the toggle in the upper left, generates a new melody. And you can decide whether it's any good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll, this is, again, a rec video recording I made this morning on my laptop to show you what this looks like. There's about three runs. I kind of roll, roll the dice three times and get three different melodies this way. Okay, so there's the first melody. You can decide if it's any good. There's a lot of big loops in <laughs> All right, and here's the third one. I'm going to adjust all eight notes. Okay, and for the last one, I changed uh, so it makes it, it does a lot of larger leaps. <laughs> so it will sound what we call disjunct. Oh. Angular melody. <laughs> So there you get the idea. And um, the, all of the code is editable under the hood for the reader so they can unlock it and see all the blocks of code that kind of allow for stepwise motion versus leap um, to minimize repetition, et cetera. There's, for the careful listener, you might have noticed that there's a very important melodic rule that was not included in my rule set for this, um, tendency tones. So I the idea in melodic writing that T should often go to do or la should go to sol. And that there are these kind of unwritten rules that within the scale, there's a kind of a hierarchy where certain notes lead to other notes. That is not embedded here. And that partially explains why it some of the results are a little bit off. And so what, one of the things I do is I, I encourage the reader to unlock the code and to add that little bit in there. Yeah. and try it out, right? To remove one rule set or put in a rule set, different rule set to 
to show that you know style, musical style is based on kind of implied rules. And by adjusting or tweaking the rules, you get different results. So if I could, if yeah. I could, so I if, if I'm interpreting your question correct, your 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 position correctly, it's the idea that a song written in C having a melody should end on the C. Yes, start and end. That's typically part of the rule set. Not always, but yeah, right. most of the time. Okay. That that was the way it was coded here. That it will start and end on C, but you can tweak that rule, right? If you don't, if you think mm, that's not the way I want mine to go, at least could always start on G. What's that called in music? You mean the tonic? The tonic is the sort of the base note of the scale. Right, but I mean resolving the melody to that note. Um, Didn't that have a name? Returning to the tonic, I think. Resolution. 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 Yeah. Usually we use resolution in a harmonic context, but yes, but yes, a leading, I think leading to a tonic would be the one that we have to say. And that's this idea of these um, tendency tones tend to lead to a particular note in the scale. Yeah, it feels like home. Yes, yeah. that's sort of tonic or tonicization. Unless and then- you, Unless you're using a mode. Unless you're using a mode, that's right. Which we could also do here, right? We could flip out the C major that's here and flip in a different pattern and try it again and see how you know what we think of it. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Related to this, can these two do some sort of like a tonal? Yes, you'd have to change the rule set under the hood, but yes, absolutely. You know, you could move from a seven-note diatonic pattern to a 12 note chromatic pattern. But still you need to tell it what kind of pattern you want. Yeah, yeah you start out with basic assumptions. And I'm sorry, I don't have the, I sh the code is available if you buy the book. <laughs> and I'd be happy to show you after the talk how you would do that. Yeah, yeah. and you don't have to be an AI wizard to do it. Here's my last demo. Um, this was a student project made by Ed Quinn, who graduated here in 2022, uh, interactive multimedia major. And this was a two-week project in the class that, that you and I had together in the spring of, what was that, 2021? 2020. 2020. Uh, yes. So spring of, so this was the real COVID affected semester. Oh, COVID. Yep. Wow, yep. COVID. And Ev, so this was the prompt about two thirds of the way through the semester, I asked the students to make an arpeggio. So by that time in the semester, they knew what a chord was, they knew chord types, and they knew what an arpeggio was, which is basically a broken chord, a, a chord that's distributed over time. And so Ev, who was a, a, a real graphic design whiz, thought about um, the qualities of, and the variables in an arpeggiator in a completely different way that I had never thought about. I, I was thinking about kind of an, uh, the, the, these parameters in a very linear way. Ev saw that they were circular. So Ev put the arrangement of the root notes in a circular arrangement and chord qualities. And so all of these different parameters in the arpeggiator procedural coding, Ev saw as a design, -ish, design problem. So I really like the way that they did that. And so this video will just show a little bit of how you might operate this arpeggiator. It, it, uh, it does show a little bit of what's under the hood at the very end. So that'll give you a sense and, and feel free to comment as you're listening. There's a major arpeggiator. A major. A major. Now we're going to change the chord quality to dominant. Change the root. We're back to major, now minor. The diminished arpeggio. These are just patterns. We're just flipping in patterns of notes and intervals. Now we're changing the directionality when it goes up and down. Up followed by down. Mm. Ukulele pattern allows you to alternate up and down. And now the randomness button randomizes all the parameters. Oh, here's a little bit of the code under the hook. <laughs> 
they, they really do look like Lego bricks. Or if anyone here has used LabVIEW, it's a little bit like LabVIEW. So there you go. <laughs> the two week homework at TTNJ. <laughs> yeah, this is Max. Yes. Max is free to use for 30 days. It's cross platform. After 30 days, it costs $10 a month. So I think the last big idea in my talk is really um, just, just to kind of, um, this is from the final chapter in my book, is where I, I kind of take what, what did we learn from going through this kind of step-by-step -step set of um, tutorials and prompts in, um, in music and coding. And so what I get to ultimately is some theories about music as a proto form of AI. And really my idea is just that, you know, we've only had computers for, what is it, 70, 80 years now, something like that. Uh, you know, but you know, humans have had culture for well over 10,000 years. And of course we've existed for many, many more millennia than that. So, you know, when you think about the entire sweep of human history and this moment in time of computing and AI, it's just the very tiniest little bit of time in the, in the arc of human, human experience. And so for all of those years prior to, let's say the 1920s, <laughs> um, we used music as a procedural simulation platform, not unlike modern computing. Mm -hmm. That we, you know, the composers wrote down patterns of notes that expressed their feelings and thoughts, right? And handed those sheets of paper to musicians who played <laughs> out the notes, right? And generated the sound, clouds of sound. And we perceived those clouds of sound and those modified our emotions and our thinking. I don't know if you were, you're like me, but whenever I sit in a concert, I start having thoughts that I don't usually have. <laughs> my mind wanders and I hope so. Yeah. And so my theory about that is that those encoded patterns that were put, put in place by the composer and then performed by the musicians are really just forms of thinking and forms of simulation that allow us to um, feel what it feels like to think inside another person's head. Mm -hmm. And, and that idea, I, you know, I have to claim uh, my conversations with Marvin for having influenced my thinking around that. But I, I really do think that that's true. And I think that partly explains why music has a therapeutic effect, that we feel another person's emotions and can experience them from a safe distance and kind of think about them and listen to them and you know, turn them around in our imagination, right? And and the same thing with creativity, that we're kind of expressing our innermost thoughts and feelings in a abstract and therefore safe way. Um, so so that's that's my idea. I, I welcome your feedback on it. You know, my, my thinking is not that music itself traditionally was was absolutely like AI. I mean, it doesn't generate text and images, right? It's, it doesn't do any of that, but it simulates that experience of thinking or feeling inside another person's mind. Um, so I think that's that's pretty much. Oh yeah, I I could keep going on, but I think maybe I'll stop here because I'd love to have some dialogue around that. And Rebecca has very kindly made available um, the the book for sale is upstairs in room two twelve. So if anybody wants to buy it based on this, uh, we will happily march upstairs and and I'll sign it for you upstairs okay. <laughs> at the the um, the TCNJ bookstores. So so we can make dialogue for. Ten minutes or so, and then I go up, and we can all talk up there. Yeah, we can chit chat. <laughs> That'll be wonderful. That'd be good. I'm wondering, um, do you have background <laughs> in making music or having any kind of music experience? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine. No, I mean, I I grew up playing violin. I started at age seven, so I did you know all the sort of normal things one does. You know, I took violin lessons, played in youth orchestras, and in school. Um, you know, Went to for advanced study in college and then study conducting and composition and then electronic music. So I kind of kept adding on to it uh, the kinds of because I that I thought it was fascinating you know, all the different ways that music can be made. Yeah, so so I've experienced the world both from a kind of a performer and a composer and a conductor. Um, and even I've even spent a year abroad learning music of another culture. So. Wow. 
Where was that? It was in India. I learned the the Raga system for a year mm -hmm. because I, you know, I was young and I wanted to do something interesting, and I had the opportunity to do it. And so, you know, for me, musical experience is fascinating and uh, you know, very rich, very enriching. Uh, question. So, in your travels, have you come across a way to help students internalize rhythm? So like you've been talking about a way to conceptualize rhythm by seeing it in a program or code it, mm -hmm. which is good. That's a start, but it's fundamentally different from sitting with an instrument and tapping your foot. True. And knowing that well, I could do it, yes. but I can't explain exactly how I'm doing it because <laughs> I've been doing it for so long. Right. But it's one of the key things I think guitar students have difficulty with when I'm pushing somebody with guitar. Mm -hmm. I find myself trying to get them to tap their foot before anything else because yeah. if they can't feel the rhythm, they're not going to get anything else after that. So, have, has this applied to that at all? I definitely talk about music as a very embodied experience, and that is one of the ways that it's not like AI at all, right? Because, yeah. <laughs> because you know, ultimately, it comes down to the rhythms that our bodies can do, right? That our musculature and our arms work in particular ways. We're very kind of we have two of uh, two of each hand and. 10 fingers and that affects the way we think about music. Our heart beats in a particular way and that helps us uh, also think about rhythm. There's all kinds of physical ways that rhythm, we learn rhythm from our world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. The embodiment is critical. Mm -hmm. I talk about rhythm and meter using physical analogies. Sort of one, two, one, two, yeah. right? And I'm sure you do too, mm -hmm. right? You, when you first teach it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so music helps us bridge the physical and the intellectual and in, in also in ways that are that are helpful. Did I sort of answer your question? Yeah, I think understanding how music connects us to our bodies is really important as a teacher and you know, think about how we got here. Yeah, John. What they're learning to do is another form of language. And in some universities, uh, they consider the ability to uh, read music as fulfilling the foreign language uh, requirement yes. 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 because it, it's abstract, it's difficult, it's uh, difficult to learn and, and totally meaningless to the uninitiated. Uh, but that's only one way. We, we, we learn it one way. This way is also a different way. We're in the same language. It's much more visual. Yeah. But again, but the thing that's missing, as he said, is that haptic response. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and obviously I'm not anti-notation. Like I, <laughs> I, you know, I think a notation is also really important. I'm just offering another branching point, and hopefully, the people who reach the end of this branch will want to loop back and then learn notation as well, right? But That's, this is notation. It's just a it different is. kind. It's a different kind. Yeah. And I learned that when I came here to TCNJ and I would teach music theory classes in the morning, and then I would teach electronic music composition in the afternoon. And the students in, were both able to write tonal music perfectly well, one group through the five line staff and one group through putting colored bricks on a screen and <laughs> software. Both wrote tonal music. Question oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I had the pleasure of reading the first chapter of your book. I had a copy of it. Um, and I was really interested in your the whole idea of your um, music education justice with um, especially to um, you know kids who are come from you know backgrounds and communities where they don't have the ability to get music lessons as kids and learn instruments and their schools have instruments they can use and so forth. And I just wondered if this has seeped out at all it to some of the the you know local school districts. Um, just my daughter was a, is a music ed teacher mm -hmm. and she started out in a school in Philadelphia and when she got to the school there was not one piece of sheet music there was no instrument there was like maybe the broken piece of a you know of a bassoon laying on the floor and and you know how do you teach music when you have that those tools to start with um so i just wondered if if any of this is seeping out into communities i hope that it will it just launched a few weeks ago so i'm just at the beginning of this process and my editor assures me that this is a marathon not a sprint so <laughs> and it may take years right 
And the whole methodology of teaching, uh, particularly in the music and education curriculum, which is a certified curriculum, is so very different from what I'm proposing that there may take, it may take, a, assuming that people like my method, or maybe they'll make something like it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that that it, it's going to take years to kind of figure out how to bridge this divide between kind of a traditional way of thinking about this and perhaps a way that might reach a wider population. But thank you for your interest. And I do hope that, that my ideas at least are, you know, hit the mark. Yeah. So at what level is your approach? Is it for, you know, kindergarten or elementary or... And at what point do they do the notation? Or I know you, you would be able to support both, right? Yeah, so the book is really written for a college level student. So it could work as a college textbook. It could also work for an advanced high school student. Um, who's so, just starting with music. Yep, or an adult learner who's doing it just for fun. And I do hope to do like a web course based on this, which might you know reach more adult learners. I think there are a lot of adult learners out there who like to do music on the side. Yeah, so I'm hoping that it'll reach that population too. Um, yeah. uh, and what was, you had another question. But, yeah, oh, about notate. Well, the notation I just leave out. I just have to leave it out because I, it would have taken me another three years. <laughs> <laughs> Next book, so, <laughs> volume two. Mental. Are you going to be a part of, I know there's a summer camp this summer for um, future music educators. Will this topic be a part of that? It hasn't been included in that camp, but I'll be in the other camp that week teaching um, music composition and production. So there'll be a little crossover, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Oh, so I always thought of music like a universal language. Yeah. And it's kind of like being in the moment. Yeah. And I have a question for you, and I don't know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about this. You know, Einstein was considered one of the geniuses of when he couldn't find a problem and he had nobody to go to, he would pick up his violin and he would play and he would find a solution for the music. Is that yeah. true? Well, that's what I've heard too, but I think it's because his mind would wander like mine does when I, right? And I, I think he would just think new thoughts. But it would harmonize him a little bit and bring him back into a solution. Yeah, I've heard that story too. Yeah, has anyone else heard that? Yeah. Yeah, he famously he he played violin and really valued that time. Except a question, another story. Beethoven was supposed to have become completely deaf. Yes. And yet he was able to compose. Yeah. Is that, is that true? How how? How does the brain work that well, he could and, do that? And he became deaf, I think, as a teenager. Maybe John can validate that. I think it was early teen. Well, it started as a teenager, but it progressed until when he got to his latter years, he was completely deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, when you learn music the, the old-fashioned way, if you... And it's one of the more difficult things to learn, but as you go along... And I've composed and I've arranged. And there are times when I can sit down and I can arrange... And you get to the point if you're that if, if you're that that astute where you can hear what you're writing. Yeah. You can you can look it on the page, you can interpret it, you can hear it in your head. And of course, he could hear it in his head. He just couldn't hear it physically. But he did. There were other people too who couldn't hear music very well mm -hmm. and let consider themselves pretty astute in music. You know, Thomas Edison, for instance, right, yeah, is almost totally deaf. He would fight. Well, well, Beethoven did it too. He would bite the piano. Edison would bite his phonograph because through bone conduction, they'd be able to hear it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and what John is talking about is inner hearing is often the word that's used as it mm -hmm. can develop by the time you're a teenager, which could explain why you he had it, enough of inner hearing that he could compose those great symphonies wow. and connect it to the kinesthetic piece of, of playing at the keyboard and then writing it down, you know? So you have to have all these different capacities and connect them together in order for that to work. There's some people who are tone deaf. That, does that mean that they don't have the capacity? Yeah, but I've, I've read that tone deafness is more of a social construct than an actual matter of equipment. <laughs> because I, I've often told students of mine, music students of mine when I used to teach music, that there isn't anybody who is tone deaf unless you're really deaf 
because otherwise your voice would be like people who are deaf, their voice is very flat and they have to be taught how to raise and lower their voice. So if someone says they're tone deaf, it's just that they're not making a connection between the notes that we see them on the page and what they're hearing. But, other, but their voice is going up and down. And so I've actually been able to convince them that, no, you're not really tone deaf. You just didn't connect these parts together. Or somebody told you at some point in your childhood that you couldn't do it. That you couldn't sing or, right, right, exactly. And that can be so devastating to yes. a person to think that they're not capable of doing anything. Yes. And I think, I think it's tied up a lot of that. At the beginning yeah. of this country, right, right. you had to do was to learn how to read music so that you could sing at church mm -hmm. and you'd be able to read music and do that. Mm -hmm. Tone deaf became a construct of people who just couldn't read it. Oh, yeah. right. they, they could sing, <laughs> but they couldn't read music. And so that's the, those are the people. We and there are about. some people that I've also found over the years that they hear the harmonics of a note because it's not just a pure sinusoid tone. It's It has harmonics. But some people, if you ask them to sing the note that you played, they're actually will sing back one of the higher harmonics because that's what their ears are telling them. So again, they're hearing it. They just... They're not identifying it the same way that the majority of people are. Mm -hmm. Oh, just kind of going off an earlier question, actually. I know STEM is, and STEAM has become a bigger and bigger thing, especially with like younger people um, and like even like music therapy and stuff. I was wondering if you think this kind of method could be, you said earlier, it's kind of geared towards college students, maybe advanced high school, mm -hmm. if it could be geared towards a younger audience, even like maybe like middle school, even or whatnot. And if so, do you think the, the approach would be different? That's a great question. I do think that a lot of kids are learning coding in school. Yeah. Uh, especially like scratch and things like that. Yeah. And um, I feel like maths, yeah, I don't know. I just, could work. a thought, yeah. Yeah. Or scratch could be uh, adapted for this same idea, right? So, yeah, I think it could be incorporated into maybe fourth, fifth grade coding classes. I feel like just even just growing up with that kind of thing could be cool too. Yeah. That'll be the next book, I guess, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Uh, thank you for your attention and if you'd like to continue the conversation we can move upstairs to 212 for a few minutes thank you everyone for coming this ends our track it's extraordinarily successful